Hi, and welcome to Matt Holman Talks Mental Health, the podcast where I have the opportunity to sit down and talk mental health with amazing humans. For this episode, I'm so happy to introduce Rob Stevenson to the conversation. Welcome, Rob. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me. Really good to be here. Oh, brilliant stuff. Well, thank you for participating in this as well. So quick introduction for me. I'll let you do a proper introduction, let people know who you are. Uh, so Rob and I are connected through, again, as many of these conversations are, through social media, through a connection in, in LinkedIn in particular. Um, I love the work that Rob's doing. He's very much into this world of mental health and well-being and supporting these conversations, which is just perfect for a conversation just about mental health. So excellent stuff. Uh, Rob, I'll let you do a proper introduction. Tell everybody a little bit about yourself, what you do. Thanks, Matt. So I am a mental health campaigner, and that means I'm on a mission of helping inspire the creation of mentally healthier workplaces and societies. And what does that mean? It means organisations where you can put your hand up and say, I'm struggling with mental ill health. But it also means where employees and people are inspired and equipped to prioritise positive mental health or well-being or form, which we will talk about. So um, there's a bunch of stuff that I do within that. I'm the founder of something called the Inside Out Leaderboard, which showcases senior business who are open about the fact they have a mental health challenge and then under that brand we've got the inside out awards we've got the inside out charter and i do a lot of public speaking and consulting with organizations on mental health and well-being strategy and then the other main strand to what i do is form score which is a movement facilitated by technology helping answer that question how are you today uh, about our well-being and facilitating connections with friends with family with trusted colleagues so a bunch of stuff but all around kind of moving that mental health agenda forward in our workplaces and our society brilliant stuff and i know we share so many common thoughts around sort of helping support these conversations getting more people talking and really checking in with people more frequently which i know that's part of you know what form score is really about isn't it it's about frequent checking with ourselves so we'll get to that because what i want to get to first is this journey with mental health as i always ask the question you know the big question tell us a story about your journey if that's okay rob you determine what that looks like and how that feels um but yeah share with us what's what's happened to you or where you've been yeah, thank you. So, I mean, we all have mental health, right? And we, at some point, become aware of that. And we usually become aware of that because we have a challenge to our mental health. You know, we don't wake up one day and think, wow, I've had brilliant mental health for the last 10 years um, and, and start reflecting on that. And we yeah. probably should. But, you know, for me, I look back through my late teens and my 20s and I see signs of erratic behaviour that later turned out to be a mental illness. And, yeah, you know, I remember my first year at university in in a my halls of residence room. It was about seven p.m., and I heard a knock at the door mat, and I kind of froze and pulled the blankets around me. I was in bed, and I just prayed that the people on the other side of the door could not come in. I'm experiencing a fear reaction, and I could hear him saying, "You know, he must be in there. He must be in there." And after a while, they walked away, and I could kind of relax and breathe again. And thing is it was two of my best friends at university just picking me up to go to some function or another that we'd arranged to and I couldn't face them and I did not know why and I talked through my 20s as being just extremes of either locked in a room thinking I didn't like people um, being antisocial that's what I thought I thought I was just antisocial yeah. or at the other end of the scale I'd be taking risks I'd be taking my clothes off in public I'd be the life and soul of the party I'd be great fun to be around I'd be making chaos happen everywhere and it was brilliant and everything in between yeah. and I didn't think anything of it I just thought I was different which I was and then as I entered the workplace and traveled through my 20s and got closer to my 30th birthday I started spending increasing amount of times outside of work where I just couldn't face going in. I'd go to parks and walk around, you know, I just couldn't go to the office. And I, I thought it was because I didn't like what I was doing, which um, I was uh, a, a recruitment consultant at the time. So may, maybe there's some truth in that matter. Yeah. But, um, you know, actually what was happening was I, I was experiencing depression, but I didn't know what it was. And then I had this amazing boss at the time and she noticed that something was wrong and said I think you need some help and she had suggested I go to the doctor but she'd also researched the numbers of some therapists locally and 
um, persuaded me and inspired me to go and get some help, which I did. And then I was diagnosed with depression, which later became a bipolar diagnosis. And uh, for your listeners, if they don't know what bipolar is, it's a mental illness characterized by extremes of mood from deep, dark depression to periods of hypermania where you can take risks and make bad decisions and everything in between. And there's some strengths and some positives in there, like creativity, drive, ability to challenge the status quo, all of that. And so I was diagnosed and I thought, brilliant, I can be fixed. You know, the, the medical profession can give me a pill and some therapy and they'll make me well, which it did for a while. And then six months later, the depression came back, but came back with a loss of hope and a sense of futility and a, and a strong sense that I did not want to be alive anymore. And I, I remember the, there was a time um, my good mates in my garden in Clapham Common beautiful summer's evening we were just talking rubbish shooting at the breeze you know having a drink here you, know, you see these lads we all owned a bar together on clapham common you could right. think these guys we just yeah. got it all we're having such a good time laughing joking telling tales and then eventually my friends went away and went to bed and went home and i could drop the smile i could drop the facade and i could carry out my plan which that night was to end my life because of that sense of futility now clearly i was unsuccessful in that attempt and I was picked up by um, a beautiful man, a good friend of mine, uh, who you know, looked after me that night, took me to my therapist the next day. And I had this nucleus of people around me that would help me and I could talk to about what I was going through. And with the combination of therapy, medication, building up self-awareness, building up an understanding of what the proactive drivers of my mental health are, over the years, I learned to manage my condition, um, not not in a fail safe way, but I learned to know when I was in a period of depression and know that that was temporary, that that was not permanent state of being. I learned to recognize with the help of my now wife that when I'm entering a period of hypermania and I get my decision sense checked and all of that. But, you know, my journey then changed to be a campaigner because I was managing that challenge, those challenges in silence, other than those close friends and family that knew about it because of the stigma. Yeah. Um, you know, and your background of we need to talk about mental health is so true because if we're experiencing mental ill health, talking is the start of the process to recovery. Yeah. Now, I was fortunate, I, I had some close people to do that. But the world at large, I thought, you don't talk about mental illness. I was scared that clients, that friends, that employees yeah. would judge me um, and treat me differently. And that is the stigma of mental illness. And I remember in 2017, we saw Prince Harry share his story. And Prince Harry's in the press a lot, but he shared his story with Brian Lee Gordon. And that was a catalyst in the UK society for more openness about mental illness. We yeah. saw the workplace picking it up. My friend, Jeff McDonald, I heard him talk, a uh, prolific campaigner. And I thought, you know, why am I hiding this? Why am I putting physiotherapy in my diary every time I go and see a therapist for years? My team must have thought, Matt, I have the worst physio in the history <laughs> of physiotherapy. Right, yeah. Um, and so I decided to share my story. Um, but the reaction to me sharing it in that pretty awkward face post was one of, people confiding back to me about their own challenges Impressive. and that sent me on the direction to do what I do now and be a campaigner. Wow and it's an incredible um, story as well and all those elements and I thank you for sharing those and I know you, you talk openly and publicly about those things but you know again it's just it's just wonderful to hear somebody be open and honest and, and you know share some of that and especially those lower moments those harder moments as well right because they're not easy to to think about and go back to I guess. Yeah and I think it's important, right? Mental health has become fashionable. And, and by that, I mean that organizations have grabbed onto it. People talk, which is great. Yeah. But I think I understand that when we're talking about a, a serious, you know, serious mental illness, and you're a Samaritan, so you see this from the other side, yeah. um, that, that actually there are some really difficult and dark times that people have to come to terms with. But there's always hope in, in us being able to do so. So I made a commitment, actually, that when I started being open and sharing my story and being, you know, publishing my form score and being on stages that I would share exactly how I'm feeling, the good and the bad. So yep. today I'm, you know, really good form, eight out of 10 um, on good energy and everything else. Yep. But if I was a four out of 10, I'd still be here and I would be sharing that as well, because I think it's important to know that we all oscillate, we all move up and down that continuum. Yep. Um, and 
you know, there will be people that might listen to this that, that could be a four out of 10 or a three yeah. out of 10 yep. or be in that really dark place. And my message to them is it's temporary. There is always hope and it can get better and it will get better. Brilliant. And I really embrace that. And I, you know, I talk about that as well. This fluctuation in our mental health happens all the time, doesn't it? And it's about having that. You mentioned it earlier about self-awareness and having the ability to sort of, you know, think about, OK, so, or, or feel some of those thoughts and think, OK, well, this is this is a hard day or this is going to be tricky. And my energy levels do feel low. So let's talk about form score, because I'm you know, really fascinated by this concept. And of course, it's getting a lot of sort of notice and publicity to it, which is fantastic because it's definitely a tool that that really helps. So tell us, how did it happen? What, what, where did it come from? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it, it's 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 a beautiful story of something yeah. that, that just grew organically. Yep. Um, now, probably about 12 years ago, um, a therapist worked with me to just identify a way of just tracking my mood, you know, okay. because for me, I can get very high with the hypermania and then I can get very depressed. And there's a bit in between that I have more influence over my mood and I can proactively take steps to, to manage it. Yep. And so she suggested that I just track my mood with a score out of 10. Very simply, how do you feel today with a score out of 10? So I started doing this. And so, you know, as, as, as mentioned, I'm an eight out of 10 today. Yep. If I start to go seven, six, five in the next few days, I'm very simply asking myself, why is that? And there's a bunch of questions that I've evolved around it that I've asked myself for years, but it's all around those proactive drivers of our mental well-being. Yep. How well have I slept? How well have I exercised? Do I feel connected to people that are important to me? Do I have a strong sense of purpose? Um, is my financial well-being in order? Am I helping others? Am I balancing stress with moments of recovery, et cetera, et cetera? And sometimes, not always, I can identify what's causing that, that drop, um, i.e., I might be experiencing too much work stress or I'm not sleeping enough or I haven't got out and exercised or I'm not connected enough to my wife and children. Yep. And then I can take steps and, and I can take steps to adjust my life and small steps, little tweaks to think, OK, maybe I'll go to bed this afternoon and get a, catch up on some sleep or maybe I'll get out and go for a walk in nature. And that can often then just stop that drop to being a, a, a low score and ultimately causing depression. Again, not fail safe, but it's building that awareness. Yeah. Now, as a campaigner, I thought a couple of years ago, why don't I just start publishing it and see what happens? I'm being open about my story. I'm putting yeah. everything out there on LinkedIn. Why don't I start publishing my score? And so initially I started putting it in my email signature and people were saying, I really like getting an email from you because I want to know what your score right. is that day. There was this sense of curiosity, yep. which we, we started to explore. Other people would say, of course, you know, when when I posted a, a low score, they would check in with me and reach out, which is great. Yeah. Yep. Um, but others would say, I love it when you're an eight or a nine out of 10 on your email, because that gives me a lift. And so there's yep. this idea, this concept of form being infectious. Yeah. So I thought I'm onto something here. So the next thing I did, I started putting it on my LinkedIn profile. And again, people started reacting to it. Other people started posting theirs. There's a chap down in Australia, uh, Todd Hopwood, who um, put his score on a whiteboard outside of his office okay. um, and would put it each day so his colleagues would know how he was doing. Yeah. And we started to see organisations and people using it organically. And I thought, you know, I'm onto something. So I started then talking about it in my keynotes. And I would like share my score. I would share the, the thinking behind it. I would share the questions. And then what I would do is invite people in the audience to think, right, what is your score? And then have a conversation with the person next to you. And it was, it was amazing, Matt. It would start off like really quiet and people yeah. whispering. And then the volume of noise, noise. would rise, the yeah. eye contact, and people were smiling and laughing. And I couldn't shut the room up. And I, I did it in small rooms, big rooms. And I'm like, wow, people are really connecting over the simple question, what's your mental health today, effectively? What's your yeah. score today? Yep. And so that really then motivated me to think, okay, there's something in this about connection. There's something in this about self-awareness. There's something in this about tracking. And there's a million mood trackers out there. I'm not trying to be another mood tracker. No. And we developed form score as a way to give that gift of self-reflection, but then importantly, connect with others that we care about, friends, Brilliant. family, trusted colleagues, to share form scores. So if you, you know, we're connected on the app, you can then see my score drop from an eight to a five. You'd get a notification, hey, Rob's score has dropped by three points today, check in with him. So it's opening the door to peer support, 
yep. um, by giving that awareness that a friend might might need so, you know, to to have a little message or a call. Um, and then at an organizational level, what we can do um, in the workplace is um, aggregate those scores up anonymously. Um, and then we can have a measure of organizational score, which is pretty powerful. It's like a real time well-being metric. Um, and we're trialing that with organizations to pretty good effect right now. So it's a really interesting, simple concept that that actually solves a big problem yeah. in that we don't have the self-awareness about our mental well-being and we don't like talking about it. Um, so the score out of 10 and sharing that score out of 10 is a very simple way of solving those those problems. Wow. What, a, what, what an incredible, simple solution as well. It, it, that's it, isn't it? Sometimes we try to over-engineer everything by going, it's got to be complex. It's got to have bells and whistles and everything attached to it. And sometimes it just goes back to a simple question to ask yourself. And I, I just find it fascinating. So for anybody out there that wants to download, because it's an app, right? So it's an app yeah. that you download. It's it's a free app as well. There's yeah. no there's no cost to it. And it's from formscore.com today which is the website right which i can yeah. see is in the screen there but for anybody listening they wouldn't know yeah. <laughs> they wouldn't know it but i'll put it in the links anyway to this pot uh, to this podcast this recording but it's fascinating it really is to, to think how something so simple can actually have so much impact what i loved was the way that you said people engage with both your lower scores and your higher scores in a you've lifted me by being an eight or a nine and i think that's fascinating isn't it it's yeah how, how does that work it's you know, I guess it's just the way that we are as humans. We we like to to feel yeah, others well, are I think, in good places. Go you're right. I think it's really interesting though, because you know the the way the um, the, the the form score is set up, and I'll just oh. you a bit of the, the, the different background. Yeah, uh, I know the pods can't listen to this, but you've got. Yeah. So what what we're showing here is the the home screen where you've got your score in the middle, and then you've got a circle of uh, trusted colleagues and friends and people you're connected with around the outside. And so you can see immediately the scores of those eight people or so. Now, what's what's really interesting when you start talking about circles of support yeah. in, in any group, you'll have a few people that are generally positive. Um, and nines and are flying emojis around everywhere and a, yeah. a, a real lifting force amongst the group. Other people might need support. Other, other people are there that they, they want to give support. So you've got this real blend of um, different perspectives um, in, in this group. But I've got this concept that I'm working with, um, which is around, I started calling it herd immunity for mental illness. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that's not quite right because yeah. herd immunity would imply that, you know, that the illness is a virus, et cetera. But it, this concept of collective resilience, I think is a better way where you've got a group that, that are supporting each other and providing that buffer against dr low form dropping. And you do need people that are, you know, the eights and nines to do that because they they bring everybody else up. You do need the carers. You do need the people that need support. Um, and it, it all kind of works when you've got that blend. But in any friend group, um, and when you start mixing your circles of friend, work, family, you've got that. So you've got this circle of support and it's a it's a fantastic concept. Well, you know what? I, I'm sold on it. You've told me it in like two <laughs> minutes and I'm like, right, now I need to go and set up a friends group with my friend. And I'm, jo I'm not joking, you know, I'm serious. And I think that's probably what you're seeing as a reaction to people. The simplicity of it is ridiculous, you know, in yeah. the sense that it doesn't take a lot of setup, does it? It just takes a few people to download an app and connect to each other. And, and there yeah. we go, you know, if we're using it together. I love this sort of um, collective resilience, you know, because because that is the struggle with mental health, isn't it? When we're struggling on our own, you feel like there's no hope. There's no opportunity to change that. Nobody really is interested. I, I can reflect that to when I talk to people in the Samaritans world and listening to people say, I can't share my story. I can't talk to others about what's going on. They've all got their own problems. And actually yeah. what you're creating is this way that says we all have problems or challenges, right? <laughs> so yeah. Wouldn't it be nice yeah. if we could sort of one day just go, you know what, I'm a five today or a four today. And somebody says, oh my gosh, I hear you. And I'm sorry, dear. what could we do to make you a five or a six or, or yeah. top it yeah. up a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. It's re re really simple concept, you know, and it's technology that facilitates a movement of openness and, yep. and peer support. That's the, the 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 big plan, and I think you know we'll see people like it. Uh, we're growing pretty quickly, and uh, lots of people are doing exactly what you say, going on there and then inviting their friends, and then creating yeah. those those ready-made support groups. 
Uh, all the power to you and for you, your work with doing that, you know, and bringing that Thank to you. life. I think it's just incredible, mate, honestly. A um, couple of other things I wanted to bring into the conversation, if that's okay. Uh, you're, when this comes out, you're, you're going to be delivering something the following day, it looks like at the moment, on the 27th of March, you're doing a TEDx talk. Yes. How do you feel about that? I'm super excited about that. I mean, yeah. I'm a, I, you know, I'm, I'm a keynote speaker, I'm a public speaker, and I think for any speaker delivering a, a, a TEDx um, and is, is important. Have you, have you done one? Did I see that on your I profile? have done one, yeah. yeah. I have yeah. done yeah. one, yeah. I thought yeah. so. Um, and um, so I've been wanting to do one for, for a while. Okay. Um, you know, I'm probably delivering three or four keynotes a week, right, to clients Amazing. and conferences. But yeah, for me as a speaker and you know someone passionate about the craft, um, yeah. getting a, a TEDx debut was was important. So, again, I'm not going to give it away, but I, it's uh, it's all around the stuff that we're talking about, being intentional about uh, yeah. about our well being and a bit of a call to action to our societies. So, yeah, thanks for for noticing that. But it's um, it, it's super exciting. Tell me about yours. Uh, mine was about us all being 24 hour humans, right? So yeah. it's this realization when I was working in a corporate role, I was spending every hour of the day working, right? It was more about work than life. And, and it's that balancing point, isn't it? That we talk about, you know, work-life balance. It's poor for many people. I had a really terrible work-life balance. My focus was all on making money and helping other people get rich. And at, at that point when I crashed, I think that was the moment of realization that said, actually, life's a little bit different than what I'm living. You know, every day is 24 hours to do good things. And now I can say, honestly, you know, as I do to anybody that I train, deliver messages to, that's how I work now. You know, I look at my diary in a totally different way than I used to. I don't look at it and go, oh, my God, I've got so many things to do. I hate this word busy. I don't like people using the word busy because I think it's just a, an excuse to not do the things we want to do. Oh, I can't go to the gym today because I'm too busy. I can't do this because I'm too busy. And and we, we sacrifice the good stuff. And that's what it is. So that's what I talked about. I just gave a little bit of a, a blurb around you know 18 minutes of me talking about being a human basically so. yeah i think that's interesting and it's 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 obviously directly connected with what we've just been talking about that, that you know the, the gift of self-reflection is one thing to know mm -hmm. what is driving your well-being and then yep. the the self-discipline to take action and in in the context of what you were saying there it could be as simple as diarizing your exercise yep. um you know putting putting a buffer in between home and work where you might go and walk outside you know very simple things yeah. but actually why do we want to do that well ultimately they'll make us happier but they'll make us higher performing you know roger, roger federer would sleep 10 hours a, a night yep. and you know he's never going to be the greatest tennis player ever if he doesn't do that lebron james is you know a prolific business person um uh, you know la lakers you know all of that sort of stuff but he, he has a two hour nap every day yeah. because he prioritizes his well-being. Right. Yeah. And we as corporate athletes need to do that much Stop. more rather than thinking we yeah. can, are superhuman and can just go back to back to back to back with no holidays, no breaks or whatever it might be. You must have read some of my scripts that I use. For what I did. <laughs> Honestly, though, Rob, seriously, I talk about three core elements to everything we do, which is prepare, uh, preparation, performance and recovery. And the thing we sacrifice the most is recovery. Yeah. You know, because because we feel like and, and, and the number of people when I say, why do you book one hour meetings, you know, back to back? Why don't you have a 45 minute meeting or a 50 minute? And, and there's this, this moment of enlightenment that says, well, actually, in Outlook, you can change the time on them. You don't have to put yeah. one hour. It's just it defaults <laughs> one hour. But, and, and it's fascinating to see how many people do have diaries that just go back to back to back to back to back there's no yeah. natural breaks i said well when do you go and grab a coffee or use the, you know the facilities and it's it's like well i just have to run and you know and you're like really yeah. wanna... recovery is interesting isn't it because mm. people use the word stress and stress has got a really bad name oh. um unfairly so because stress yeah. we need stress right yep. stress stress enables us to do our jobs hit a deadline it enables us to be you know reasonably buoyant while we're talking to each other and, and being recorded you know you need to be activated to perform yeah. the problem isn't stress the problem is under recovery from stress you know so if you're in a flight or fight scenario um actually if we ran away to escape you know a, a saber-toothed tiger back in the day yeah. when, when we escaped we'd rest um so we would then have the reserves to escape again or fight again but what we're doing in the workplace is going from stress to stress to stress yeah. with no recovery so it's yeah. under recovery that's the problem isn't it 
Yeah, and it's and you know then it links into preparation, doesn't it? So if you've got to perform at this high level, you have to have recovery and preparation is a critical element. So you know I can't go into a meeting if I don't know what the meeting is going to be about. It's a bit pointless, really, isn't it? So I need to do something to prepare. Doesn't yeah. mean you have to spend hours doing it, of course, but at least be prepared for whatever's coming. It's yeah. it's such a fascinating thought, and and that's what I think people struggle with because we, I don't know about you, but I feel we've been conditioned through systems and processes that mean it's all on time, like which is why twenty four hour humans were such an important element for me which was you all we all have 24 hours right I cannot have more time than you have in a day yet sometimes people feel like I've got no time to do things and yeah it's it's just a state of mind it's a conscious yeah. decision yeah I, lo I love that as well you know we, we when people say I just don't have the time well you do because we all have the same amount of time it's yeah. what do you choose to prioritize in your time yeah. um, and do you make a conscious choice in doing that yeah and I think it's interesting as we've moved from a more structured office-based environment to remote working, a lot of us don't have the self-discipline to, to, to handle that properly yeah. um, or to handle that effectively. That's probably a better way of putting it because, you know, in the office, we'd have those enforced breaks. We'd have to walk to a meeting room. We'd have to go and get our lunch. We'd have to go to the coffee machine. We'd get stopped by a colleague and all of a sudden your day's broken up. Whereas here we're like, boom, eight hours. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you've got to be intentional about putting those breaks in. Um, and yeah, you know, for me, that's an educational thing to build up the literacy of why is proactively managing our well-being important um, as individuals and how to do it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I totally agree with that. And I think every element of our life has an impact on our form score and work is one of those big ones. You know, when we talk about self-care, work is such an important part of our self-care routine as well to encourage us to take breaks, to encourage us. I think lots of people who still don't take holidays and I'm probably as much to blame for that in my own business where I just kept on going because I was like, I need to keep on going. And but but I'm very conscious of taking breaks now and not yeah. Yeah, I, to me, it's, it's interesting. I'll, I'll ask you a question. Somebody asked me about switching off at the end of the day I responded and said I switch off during the day you know so so I don't feel like I have to have a definitive this is me switching off I feel like if I need to switch off I can because a lot of people get fixated on that oh I'm working till five and I'm done but then people sneak over don't they so I don't know what do you think about that yeah I, I think it, it's it's a really interesting question and, and I think for, and, and you must feel this a little bit as well for me I'm so passionate and driven about what I do yeah. that it doesn't feel like work for me it's not a chore what I do I love what I do yeah um so switching off in the day um is, is probably not what I need but breaks in the day are what I need so I'm, I'm yeah. a big I'm a big fan of a lunchtime nap you know, oh I'll me often, too I'll often schedule them and yep. that is you know, I'll, I will switch off because I'm asleep um, my particular bipolar brain sometimes doesn't like to switch off, so I'll need to do things to, to, to force it to. Um, okay. So the big one for me is DJing. I love to spin a few tunes. Hey, and when you're, when you're in the mix, right, all yeah. you're thinking about is the music. You're not thinking about anything else. And it's, mm. it's uplifting. It's joyous. I like my music. Um, and so for me, that's my um, version of mindfulness. It's very much in that moment playing a few tunes. And if I can do that at the end of the day, that, that is a really nice way to finish up what I've been doing brilliant i i love that i i did a recording recently with a friend of mine chris and he said he likes to walk in the woods listening to trance music and it takes him back brilliant. to to years on the beach in thailand you know and just enjoying just it's just <laughs> about you know, oh yeah anyway it's really fascinating i love it um rob we are coming to the end of this conversation half an hour just disappears doesn't it you know this thing about time and i'm not putting a constraint on we have to finish in two minutes um because i want to just throw it over to you and give you the sort of floor to say anything you want to say to wrap it up anywhere you think people can get more information or we want to share anything but just from me just to say well you know we've never spoken like this as a chat you know sit down chat and it's just been fascinating i've absolutely enjoyed it it's been so enlightening for me to think about different things and you know i work in a very similar place to you in a similar world but you're teaching me so much through what you're sharing with your story so thank yeah, you th for that yeah my, my pleasure and thank you for having me it's been been great to chat and um, you're right it's uh, um it, it feels like we've made a good connection during this this conversation which is brilliant yeah um so my, my little time to, to to wrap up and thank you for giving me that. So do check out the form score app, you know, form scored up today. Um, and you know, let us know what you think. We're testing it. We're taking feedback. Would love uh, some of the listeners and watchers to uh, to check it out. 
Um, the other call to action um, for what I do is the Inside Out Leaderboard. So if in your workplace you have a senior leader who is open or prepared to be, um, have a look um, inside-out.org um, and check out the leaderboard. I'd love to hear more. Um, but I think I'd like to just leave with a, a call to action for um, everybody that hears this. And if you can do one thing today, if you can do one thing differently, that would be just be a little bit more intentional about your well-being. So ask yourself that question, how are you today? If it feels right, give yourself a score out of 10. But really reflect just for a few minutes on what is driving that. And then ask yourself the question, what could I do differently? What could I do differently that might boost my form, that might boost my well-being? And do one or two things differently over the next few days. Because if we can start in that those little marginal gains those little micro steps we can transform our lives but we've got to start by being a little bit more intentional brilliant being more intentional rob thank you so much my form score today was about a seven but it's creeped up to about an eight now because you've just inspired me with your words and wisdom and everything else that you've been going through so i really do appreciate that i genuinely mean that um, i'm going to get out and have a nice long walk at lunchtime today that's my that's my call to action for today get out and get some activity and some exercise so but brilliant stuff thank you so much for anybody that is listening still, if you are struggling or you do have any worries or concerns, you know, this thing about this podcast is about accessibility. You can always reach out to me and I'm sure Rob would be more than happy to field any questions or things if anybody needs any extra support. Uh, but there are organisations out there, of course, and, you know, I talk about Samaritans all the time, but Samaritans exist for that reason. When you're feeling those worries, those concerns, and you don't feel like you've got friends, family or anybody that you can talk to, there is always somebody that cares. Pick up the phone, 116123, it's free to call any time of day. Or you can text to shout if you prefer to send a message. So 85258 is the number. But just know somebody does care. We are listening. And it's so important that we continue this journey talking about mental health and how we're feeling. So thanks, Rob. I really appreciate it, mate. Look after yourself. You too, Matt. Thanks for Take having care. me.